insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 31. Frozen in a galaxy far, far away. Bah, ha, 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 ha. I'm your host, Joseph <laughs> Whalen, and my brilliant and radiant co host, Michelle Whalen. Hello, my dear. I'm going to have to come up with some new adjectives, adjectives to describe <laughs> you. I'll get you a dictionary. <laughs> they're, they're, all, they're all absolutely accurate. Though. Aww. So, uh, got a, got a busy show today, but before we get into the show itself, uh, recap on what we did last weekend. Last weekend. So, uh, as we had mentioned a a couple of times, there was a local, uh, comic con that was going to be in Philadelphia that we had never been to before. Honestly, hadn't really heard about it before, but it's it's been around for a couple of years now, called Keystone Comic Con. Uh, it's held in the Philadelphia Convention Center, um, and we went to it on Sunday, and we have a little video montage uh, to play, and then uh, we'll talk about it. <laughs> cool experience we had while we were there mm-hmm, definitely um had some some good guests too i was kind of surprised yeah for for being a smaller venue it really didn't have tons and tons of celebrities but you know they had some some star trek people uh they had some harry potter people uh they had some voice actors from you know various current cartoons uh there were some wrestling people they even had like a wrestling ring yeah they uh, had a whole ring set up up. that was kind of cool you know so it was kind of one of those a little bit of everything for for everyone um what i thought was kind of cool was obviously we we do a lot of the local um, convention, so we always seem to, you know, see the same, you know, vendors, you know, time and time again. Um, but there were actually some different vendors, uh, different artists that we've, you know, never seen or never, you know, noticed before. So that was kind of nice. Uh, yeah. It added a, a little bit of a, a difference uh, to it. We're not um, autograph people. W- you know, we don't, you know, wait in those lines to to see the celebrities, um, but. It seemed very organized from what we could see, uh, you know, that that area. Um, The other thing, um, I think really the only negative thing that we had was the food. Yeah, you know, and that's they could have definitely organized the food, right? And and I don't know if it's you know if it's them that organizes it or if it's the convention center. You know, that was really probably you know, and maybe a little bit more seating. And it wasn't like they didn't have the room for it. They there was definitely plenty of extra room around if they wanted to just put you know tables or or things like that. But it seemed to go you know really smoothly. Um, We went like I said on Sunday. 
Um, we got there, I guess it was around 1030 when we got there. Yeah. It had started at 10 o'clock. The big draw was obviously Tom Holland uh, was there and he was doing a panel at 10 o'clock. And even at 1030, they were still letting people in uh, to... Uh, his panel, we just decided, eh, you know, let's skip it. But we probably could have gone and, and you know, seen, you know, some of it uh, at least. Um, but we really didn't know what to expect. So it was kind of like, well, let's just kind of venture and, and see. But it was, you know, definitely a nice mix of, um, you know, if you were interested in comics, they had a, a number of people doing that. Board games, they had a whole area of that, um, the whole section of video games as well. That was one of the things that I was kind of impressed with was the, the gaming section mm-hmm. they had towards the back there was huge. It was yeah. all, you know, various console games right, that they right. had set up, both modern and classic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it was all free to play. Right, right. Uh, but on top of that, you had the, the board games like you had said. Mm-hmm. Um, the vendors, I think they were kind of light on vendors though. I, mm-hmm. I, you know, it's, it certainly wasn't as, as many vendors as you would normally see there, uh, for, you know, a convention center that right, size. Right, right. But it would also seem to be, you know, much smaller and much more manageable. Like we didn't feel overly tired after yeah, yeah. walking the floor. Like, oh, I just want to, you know, go home. That's true. You know, we could have walked, you know, and, and that was the other thing too was because it was smaller and more manageable. I felt, you know, like when we first walked around, it was like, oh, I definitely want to come back to this guy, you know, and I remembered exactly where he was. You know, it was, it was very, I, I felt it was more organized, you know, the layout, you know, uh, of it than, you know, some of the other ones that just are overwhelming and, yeah. okay, what aisle am I in? Where am but I? Well, what was kind of counterintuitive was they did their aisle numbering parallel to the entrance rather than, right. you know, in line with the entrance. Right, right. So you'd have to come into the building, come into the convention center room, walk to one of the ends, and then go up and down the right. aisles, which was kind of counterintuitive the way right, they did right. that. But again, it it was, I thought it was a perfect size, wasn't, you know, we got our tickets ahead of time, so we saved, you know, $10, um, and on Sunday, kids are free, 12 and under, so, you know. But I could definitely see us going back next year and looking at some of the panels and maybe doing the panels. I kind of regret it not sitting in on that Tom Holland Mm -hmm. panel when we walked in, because I think it would have been kind of cool. Yeah, and like I said, even for the last, you know, and it it seemed to go almost until 11 o'clock. So well, yeah, I mean, we got there and there was probably 15 minutes left. Or we thought and, there were 15 minutes left. Because well, we got there at 10:45, right. basically. When yeah. we walked, when we walked upstairs, oh, it, was it was almost 10:45. Oh, okay. And by the time we got in, we had gone down the one aisle, and everyone started coming out of right, the right. So we could have, panels. you know, seen a couple of minutes of it. So, so. but anyway, uh, got a full show today. Our Disney detective. We're going to be talking about the. Uh, launching of Galaxy's Edge at Disney World. Uh, we will be talking about the ability to bring your thermal detonators onto <laughs> airplanes now. There's some controversy around that. Then we have a, uh, a feel-good story with uh, Snow White in the parks uh, interacting with a, a young boy. Uh, then we have some Frozen news to get into. And then in our entertainment news, John Travolta once again uh, embarrasses himself at an award show, which I'm not sure why he's invited to them anymore, let alone to present. Uh, then we have a bit of information on a new show that came out, uh, Carnival Row. And uh, Leslie Jones news, uh, leaving SNL. And then we uh, pay tribute to uh, Valerie Harper, who we recently lost, uh, who had been in in poor health. And uh, then we will move on to our insightful picks of the week. So I think we've got a good show ahead of us here. Are we ready to get started? Let's do it. All righty. Go for Disney Detective. So this past Thursday, Galaxy's Edge in Walt Disney World finally opened. Um, It was actually not scheduled to open until 6 a.m. on Thursday, but officials surprised thousands of fans with early entry around 4.45 (laughs) a.m. 
Wow. That's really early. I actually had one uh, one Disney friend of mine who is actually local to the area. Um, she got there at like 3 a.m. and posted pictures on Holy Facebook. Moly. And like the main, you know, the main street area of, uh, you know, uh, of Hollywood Studios was just packed with people so <laughs> I'll bet. yeah um and it's kind of funny because for the last couple of weeks they've been doing pass holder previews and cast member previews and you know i knew various people that were going to those and it was just so quiet and it wasn't really packed or whatever and you know that's because not everybody you know not the masses were in and now it's this you know Big giant thing. Um, so now, did they do the same reservation system in Disney World? No, I don't think they actually did anything. I never. I know they. The only thing that they were doing was the virtual queue system. Basically, they were only allowing so many people in at a time, and you basically kind of got a, a reservation for a time slot to go in, but nothing like they were doing in Disneyland where, you know, you had your four hour window or whatever. Um, so it, it was done a, a lot differently. Um, I know once the, the ride opened at one point, uh, the wait time for, um, the, the one ride that's only open right now, um, was five hours, you uh, know, but, and that's kind of what people expected when right. Disneyland opened, and they mitigated most of that. Right, with because the they gave system. everybody, you know, a four-hour window, and you know, so you didn't have, you know, the wait time. Um, but you know, they were saying that, you know, they were wondering, you know, how crazy it was going to be. You know, obviously, the the big thing right now is Hurricane Dorian, who, um, as of right now, it looks like um, the last reports that I read just a little while ago um, looks like it's going to kind of miss Florida and actually it's heading up to the Carolinas, but Disney was already starting to kind of prep um, for, you know, hurricane mode. And, right. you know, I, I know there was a video uh, posted the other night where they were, you know, like by the pools, all the umbrellas and stuff, they were kind of putting that away, you know, anything loose. So as far as the uh, Galaxy's Edge, was there any announcement on why they chose not to go with the reservation system in Disney No, World? I never saw anything, you know, about that. Maybe because you know, they just Well, and, because I know the numbers, the <coughs> attendance numbers in Disneyland have been right, far maybe, lower than what they expected. Right, but obviously it looks like, you know, Hollywood Studios is is it, you know, and and Walt Disney World's probably going to, you know, surpass that. But yeah, there was nothing that ever said, and I was kind of surprised because, you know, it was so stringent in California, it was like you had to be a resort guest, and you had to be this, and you had to be this, and you and know, it, you know, it's entirely possible that scared a lot of the people off, and that's why your right. numbers were so low in Disneyland, right? And maybe you know, because they didn't do it, you know, that's why you have a five-hour wait, right? You know, in it just strikes me as odd that they handled two the two parks so, so differently, differently, yeah, in, yeah, in how this was, and it, you know, by all accounts, it was very well managed. Mm -hmm. In Disneyland, yeah, yeah, where you didn't have these ridiculous waits, and it seemed like it was an enjoyable experience. Like nobody was complaining. Oh, I had to wait in line. Yeah, you know, and for then too you turn around and, and you 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 know you blow it at Disney World. Right, right, and I I currently there's a, another Disney friend of mine who is actually there on vacation now. Um, I haven't heard really anything. I've only seen pictures uh, that he's posted, you know, on Instagram uh, of, you know, like he was obviously there during the day and then he had nighttime shots, you know, as well. So obviously, again, you could so, stay, you know, the whole time if you wanted to. Explain so. briefly what the virtual queue is. So the virtual queue, from from what I understand, was basically kind of like you weren't allowed in the area until a certain, you know, almost like the reservation system. Um, but was this done through like the fast pass system or something? I'm actually, I'm not really sure. I just remembered seeing them, you know, posting pictures of, oh, we're getting the virtual queue system, you know, set up, you know, okay. just like and we do had. Do we know if that was restricted to? Um, I don't think so. I don't think it was. Guess of the property? No, I don't think so. I think okay. it was just anybody because, again, like I said, my one friend who lives down there, she went. 
Um, you know, and she's just an annual pass holder. She wasn't a resort guest. Whereas my other friend, you know, who's up from, you know, uh, he lives in New York and he's down there. He was staying, you yeah. know, he was a resort guest, but I really haven't, you know, found out from him like, hey, how was the experience? You know, you were down there. I just know that he was there yesterday. Um, he had a picture of, you know, the blue milk. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> that was it. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how this plays out. Plus, you know, um, I know as of right now, the only, you know, the, they haven't really made any closing announcements of, you know, things that are going to be closed due to the weather. So it'll be interesting to see how between, you know, Hurricane Dorian coming in, what the attendance numbers are going to be like, yeah. you know, over over yeah, the I weekend. Mean, this, in this case, it's just a timing thing with the hurricane. Right, thing, right. But. So... So tell us about thermal detonators. <laughs> so if you if you don't know, one of the things uh, that they uh, were very happy to to announce was that they worked together with Coca Cola to develop these really cool looking thermal detonator looking Coke bottles, which go for six dollars a piece, by the way. Um, <laughs> and there was a well whole... Well worth it for a thermal detonator. Of course. That's pretty cheap when you think about it. So there was a whole big thing, you know, that started when Galaxy's Edge opened up that TSA actually was um, not allowing you to take them on the plane. You couldn't have them in your checked luggage and you couldn't have them in your carry-ons. So people were like, oh, what am I going to do with my thermal detonator? Well, as of uh, yesterday, they actually released a statement that they have lifted the ban, that you are allowed to put them in your check luggage um, or as long as they're empty, then you can put them uh, in your carry-on. So... That was kind of good news for people that, you know, wanted to bring home their their relatively cheap souvenir from Galaxy's Edge. When you, when you think that, you know, the lightsabers are, you know, $200, you know, to start your your $6, you know, can of, of uh, Coke is, is a little cheaper. So Well, and I think it was kind of interesting that they went the route of uh, – Designing them to look like thermal detonators without right. ever considering the fact that people are going to want to take these things home and not throw them out. And you right. have people walking on airplanes with what looks like a hand grenade. Right, right. You know, so it's and, like, and it's kind of like, you know, you even look at um, like snow globes. That, you know, that was a big, you used to see, you know, in the, the Disney gift shop, snow globes all over the place. And then once, you know, TSA had all these, you know, restrictions you now see that they either don't make these big giant snow globes anymore, or if they do, they make much, you know, smaller ones. And a lot of times, you know, when you go to check out at a register, they suggest, can we just ship, ship this it, home yeah. for you? Um, so, you know, so I guess it was kind of along the, the same lines of they didn't think, oh, well, the majority of the people fly well, here. And the, you know? the funny thing was, when we were <clears> down there the one time, there was uh, a toy thermal detonator mm -hmm. that looked yep. very authentic. It was a metallic look to it. Right, right. And it was like a hot potato game or something right, like right. that. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, then, you know, I have to assume people were able to, you know, get on a plane with that. Yeah. But yeah. I guess because it wasn't filled with liquid. I don't know. It's just. Right. And maybe that's why, you know, because these like are. TSA changes their rules on a regular yeah, basis. Yeah. So if you happen to be down there and you want to bring home your, you know, your bottle of, of Coke, if you want it full, put it on your, in your check luggage. If you're going to, you know, want to bring it on your carry on, make sure you <laughs> drink it first. Yeah. Interesting. Mm hmm. Um, what's next? So we have a very heartwarming story uh, that a bunch of different news outlets had posted. And this was um, Snow White uh, had a, a very special moment with a special needs child at Walt Disney World. So um, a mother who was there with her son um, had you know, one of those magical experiences. Um, the mother who actually had shared the moment on Facebook wrote that while she and her son were waiting in line at Epcot to get a picture with Snow White, he began to have an autism me meltdown. He was crying. He was just overwhelmed and just having a hard time with everything. So when it was finally his turn to take his picture, 
the princess could tell that he was special needs and kind of just took him and took him for a walk away from the crowds. And she, um, the mom shared photos of Snow White just kind of hugging him, him putting his head down on, you know, her lap, kind of, you know, her consoling, very, very Snow Whitish, right, you right. know. Um, and, you know, the, the mom said, um, you know, she was just amazing. She held his hand, danced with him, took him over to a, a bench and sat with him. Um, she definitely just went above and beyond and just took so much time with him. Um, so, again, the mother had shared this on Facebook and nearly 300,000 reactions um came with from people praising the woman for her beautiful reaction to the son's, you know, um, special needs. Uh, one person wrote, you know, God bless you, Snow White. What a beautiful gift of love. Um, the mom actually did write a letter to Disney to inform them of how thankful she was, you know, for Snow White's, you know, heartwarming actions and saying that it was just, you know, true magic and that she was just a pure angel and it was just a moment you know they would never forget so and you know it's one of those things where i can't help but bash disney and i'm not going to (laughs) bash disney for this obviously but i will point out the fact that it's exactly this kind of example that shows who makes the real magic in the park. Oh, absolutely. You know, you have people like Bob Iger who make $156 million a year thinking Mm -hmm. that he's the end-all, be-all of why the company is so successful. Mm -hmm. And it's people like this in the trenches Mm -hmm. who are doing that and giving that magical experience. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, You know, we had a similar experience years ago Mm -hmm. when we were getting our photos done in a, you know, the, one of the private you know, photo sessions that they did. Right. And they had a a malfunction on the camera. Well, they could have just easily marched us back out and put us in line until they resolved the issue. Right. But instead, you had three or four costumed characters sitting there playing Duck, Duck, Goose and Hide and Seek with our daughter for about 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, to this day, as much as I bash Disney for various things, Mm -hmm. that's the one thing that still stands out in my mind is Mm -hmm. that it's the people that are in the park that are the ones that make the experience. Absolutely. I don't care how mm-hmm. many executives you have. They don't deserve the money. The people that are it's the, doing it. It's the cast the, members. They're the ones they're that. They're the ones mm-hmm. that deserve yeah. it. They yeah. need the reward. They need the, 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 recognition the notoriety. And, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. They're the ones that make Disney what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so just my endorsement there. <laughs> Anyway, uh, one more? One more Disney detective story. So it looks like Frozen 2, we finally have some plot details and obviously a brand new song. Um, So Disney has been keeping the trailers very light on the plot details, um, but the two directors, uh, you know, finally gave a little bit of a explanation of where, you know, Elsa and Anna are going on their new quest. And they gave another little sneak peek uh, clip um, that's going to, you know, give more about their adventure. Uh, so, you know, basically what kind of came, came about is, you know, a little bit more of the past. How did Elsa get her powers? What happened, you know, to her as a, as a, a child, um, and a little bit with, um, the parents as well. Uh, so again, they're going to be doing a little bit of the past. Um, they have, uh, obviously some new characters that, they're incorporating as well and obviously a brand new song called into the unknown where elsa hints that she's heard you know this voice before in her head but just never quite understood where it was coming from and then on the other side of things Kristoff and anna's relationship is going to grow even stronger and that Kristoff is getting ready to pop the question but it looks like he's going to have a hard time getting down on one knee and proposing as anna is too preoccupied helping her sister and frozen 2 will hit theaters november 22nd wow right around the corner yeah yeah cool. getting closer so i'm excited about it i don't know if our daughter is but you know that's yeah. just me <laughs> I, I just hope that Disney's going to have the marketing and uh, right, you know, merchandising. Right, because that it. was just that was really hysterical when you know the original movie came out and it just 
blew nothing. up yeah, and you had they, but knockoffs. they had, you know, they had some things, but then everything was on back order. You know, if you wanted a dress or a doll or whatever. Mm. And like you said, you know, everything that was available was either a knockoff or, you know, you just had to, to wait. So. so last week with D23 News, we talked about a boatload of changes to Epcot. Mm-hmm. With the with the release of the new Frozen movie coming out, was there any talk of them updating the ride in Epcot? No, nothing, nothing okay. with that. You know, so everything will just kind of, you know, it'll be remain, you know, Frozen Ever After, or, you know, the original, you know, okay, the original ride. Cool. So that's it for Disney Detective. That sure is. All right, moving on to entertainment news. So tell me about how John Travolta has embarrassed himself at an award show yet again. Yeah, so he made headlines on Monday when it appeared as though he mistook RuPaul's Drag Race alum Jade Jolet as Taylor Swift in the video. Um, and she was actually dressed for the VMAs as Taylor Swift. So uh, MTV Music Awards happened earlier this week. And um, Taylor Swift had her whole crew of people uh, that had worked on her cast uh, that had worked on one of her current uh, videos and a bunch of, you know, uh, uh, drag queens and, and other, you know, characters were part of it. And one of the people that was there was actually dressed up like her. And um, so... She actually thought it was hysterical, and Travolta, you know, thought it was cool. Um, He actually was interviewed uh, at a Dallas-Fort Worth radio station on Thursday where he addressed the confusion that had happened, you know, the the night before. He said there were just, you know, so many people, you know, on the stage, and I was looking for her. So, you know, when I thought I found her, it was just like, okay, here, you know, take the award, Um, you know, and then... It was just, you know, kind of mass confusion and, you know, everybody had a good laugh about it. Um, and even um, the the woman who he had given the award to, um, you know, she thought that it was just like, oh, my God, it was my first award ever. Thank you, John Travolta, for, you know, for giving it to me. Um, you know, everybody just laughed it off. And, you know, earlier in the week, um, you oh, know, and that's a. That's kind of a statement to the costume and make our makeup artist. Yeah, there like wow, you too. looked really <laughs> <laughs> you, you look authentic. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and and it was just and it was funny because earlier in the week, uh, Taylor Swift's friend Todrick Hall, who had helped her with the video, um, and he uh, stars in it, and and he was there at the awards. Uh, he was on stage. Um, at the moment that it happened, and he ended up telling uh, Jerry O'Connell that he thought Travolta was just so confident that it was her. Like, he was just like, <laughs> here you go, and, and you know. And again, I could understand the the craziness of it. Plus, you know, there were a whole big gaggle of, of people. It wasn't like, oh, there were just two people, you know, well, up and there. Well, thankfully, so. they didn't have him read the names. Well, no. and that was kind of funny, because when he and, I believe it was Queen Latifah, were presenting the award... And she went to go hand him the the envelope, like, did you want to read it? And he made the joke of, you know, I've screwed this up before. Why don't you take it? So, you know, at least he can, can, you know, laugh at himself and and everything. So it was. Got to give him credit for that. Yeah. So it was was a funny little, you know, thing that had happened. So. Very cool. Yeah. So tell us about what I'm sure is probably going to be a insightful pick of the week coming up soon. (laughs) What gave it away? Uh, this is actually a show that that definitely seems to be kind of up my alley. Uh, it, it's called uh, Carnival Row. It um, launched on Amazon Prime uh, just this week, and it's an interesting uh, story because it, it's basically there's humans and then there's fairies, and they live together. Um, it looks like the 1800s or early 1900s England, kind of that gritty, um, you know, Sherlock Holmes kind of time period. Well, let's be honest. 
England always looks gritty at this point, okay? That's, that's such a storied that's history true. to the country. That's true. Um, you know, but it, it's, it also has a lot, uh, you know, kind of has an important story to tell because it has a lot about the social commentary on immigration and racism and discrimination issues that are part of our world right now. Oh, so Donald Trump should love this one. <laughs> Right. Um, and, you know, basically the, the two main characters is, you know, Orlando Bloom, who plays a, a human cop, and basically his um, forbidden love affair with a pansexual fairy. Um, and, you know, that whole dynamic of, you know, two different worlds, you know, trying to be together. And can you really be, you know, together in in society? Um, So the entire eight episode season is actually now available on Amazon Prime. Uh, I have yet to watch it because we were finishing up Mindhunter. So I'm looking forward to to this. It it definitely has that look um, of another show that I watched, which was Penny Dreadful. Um, Uh, Okay, yeah. So it kind of it kind of reminded me um, that uh, one person had said that the show might feel like something based on a book from Game of Thrones, um, but it's it's you know obviously set you know a different time period. But again, you have these different um, uh, races of of creatures, I guess. So I guess that's maybe where they were making you know the parallel. But again, the big thing is that. You know, um, you know, it's the social commentary, really, the underlining, you know, of the discrimination and, you know, the love affair and, and immigration and, and everything that, you know, our country is kind of going through right now. So it, it, it looks really good and I'm looking forward to, to getting into it. So cool. Very cool. So tell us uh, before we go on, I did want to make a comment of what I thought was kind of interesting about that show and what seems to be a trend in streaming now, and that is these big name movie stars mm-hmm. jumping on board with what would traditionally be seen as TV, but mm-hmm. not TV because it's streaming. Right, right. I mean, you see Orlando Bloom, who's a major blockbuster mm-hmm. star there doing yeah. that. You've got yeah. Ewan McGregor coming back to do stuff for Disney. And right. You've got countless other big screen actors, which makes me reflect back on a very early episode of the podcast that we did with um, Netflix and the Oscars. Mm-hmm. And, and how... actually there's a something I'll mention after you. Okay. So w- what, what I find interesting is you had this push by Spielberg and some mm-hmm. others to remove Netflix shows from being in right. the running for Oscars. Right. But you also now, just in the last less than a year – you see all these big screen actors um, moving into uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime and on all the other streaming services as, you know, mainstream entertainment now. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, oh, I'm a big screen actor. I don't, I'm a movie actor. I don't do TV. Uh, you're seeing a big trend moving towards that direction, which to me means – <clears throat> whatever argument had been made previously, which had been invalidated and shot down with the Oscars and Netflix, right, right, is going to have even less credence moving forward in the next award show and forward. Well, and and to kind <clears> of <throat> excuse me, and to add to that, there is a a movie that is you know very much uh, being looked forward to uh, called the the Irishman yes um, and the, it's Martin Scorsese so it's not even like it's some little whatever yep. and it's coming to theaters and it's one of those where it's going into little movie houses but it's going to be on Netflix for, and the idea yeah. of putting it in the theaters is again they're hoping to be nominated for you know an academy award where i don't think with the the movie that won last year i don't think it was their intention it was just right no it just happened it just kind of happened well well obviously they it was their intention to get it in the running and get the notoriety and maybe not to win to win i don't think think it was expected but obviously you know with this it's more you know okay maybe they're they're kind of doing it um you know and the release date 
is November 27th for the Irishman, so it's, you know, later yeah. in the year. But again, as long as it's released before a certain time, yep. before the end of the year, it can be, you know, a well, contender. And, it, and so. it needs to be released in theaters before... It's released on the streaming service, right? And that the was rules. the and that was the idea that it's going to be. It's actually uh, New York uh, Film Festival on September twenty seventh, and then uh, the IFB the the BFI sorry London Film Festival on October thirteenth, uh, and then late um, later on by by Netflix. So, but it needs to run in the LA studio right. circuit uh, uh, theater circuit. In order to qualify right, that. right, and I'm sure they have that all, you know, planned yeah. out. And well, it's, that's good, it's a big cast. <laughs> you know, it's Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, yeah. Al Pacino, Harvey Keitel. It's basically like... all the guys that always act in the mafia movies. <laughs> and you know, we haven't had a good mafia movie in we a while. We haven't had so. a good Martin Scorsese, uh, you know, mafia movie in a while. We so. had a, we had a bad Travolta mafia movie, but not a good <laughs> mafia movie. Really. Right. So we kind of just, you know, yeah. So that, you know, again, like we said, we talked about that, you know. Uh, you know, last year with, with all of that. So it'll be, you know. Yeah. Cool. So tell us about Leslie Jones, who I have to say, I absolutely adore her. Before we even get in, I absolutely adore her. Really? I'm so she's hilarious. <laughs> and she's so in your face. Yes. That's what I love about her. You know, and it was funny because I started hearing things that, you know, different projects that she was doing. So... It was kind of making me think, all right, I think she she's leaving yeah. SNL. Um, I think one of the things I saw in Entertainment Tonight was they were bringing back um, Supermarket Shopper. I can't remember. I don't think that's the, the name of what the, the game show was, where, you know, they had contestants that ran around mm -hmm. a grocery store. Yeah. Well, she's bringing it back. She's going to uh, be cool, the host cool. of it. So when I heard that, I was like... Okay, um, so, yeah, so, you know, Jones will be uh, leaving, making her exit from Studio 8H. Um, she's actually been on the show since 2014, um, and additionally, Kate McKinnon um, was actually rumored to be exiting as well, um, but as of right now, she's staying on for the 40, 45th season. Uh, NBC would not confirm any news, basically just an email um, uh, uh, CNN had sent an email to her representative. Nothing had come back. Um, but she's, you know, she was known for her frequent appearances on the mid show weekend update news segments where she would frequently comment on politics and social issues, um, which were just always spot on and, you know, definitely made you think, and you know that in your face, you know, yeah, hysterical. Like, like take no shit from anybody. Yeah. in your face. Let's not dance around the right. the controversial topic. Let's hit it straight on. Right, exactly. Um, she actually joined the cast at age forty-seven, uh, giving her the distinction of being the oldest person to join the show as a cast member. Um, it was also the first time that they had two African-American women as cast members at the same time. Um, she was actually nominated for the Outstanding Supporting Actri Actress in a Comedy Emmy in both 2017 and 18. Um, but she has a number of movie projects, you know, lined up and a comedy special uh, with Netflix that'll be coming out. Um so, you know, obviously the cast always changes, you know, you have people coming in and going. That's kind of, It's like you the know, menudo of comedy. <laughs> it is. Um, but, you know, they basically said that they will never be able to replace, you know, her unique, larger-than-life delivery, her infectious and unbridled enthusiasm for all things Olympics. Yeah. I do remember when the Olympics came out and they would have all these, you know, sketches with her on, on the Olympics or commercials. And... It was like honest. She she loved the Olympics. And it was just like her thing. Um, and, and she just had so much energy. Oh I mean, my she god! She was just a ball of energy whenever the camera was on. Yeah, her. yeah. And she was to me. She was almost like a, a, a female version of Chris Farley. Yes, I you could know, definitely see just that. that kind of enthusiasm and spontaneity, yeah. and you know, yeah. She didn't have to have. She didn't have to be scripted. Mm -mm, no, you know? and she could just kind of go off and do her thing. Yeah. Um, she's hysterical on Twitter. You can, you know, oh, yeah, I, yeah, 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 you know, I follow, I, I follow her on Twitter. And again, like you said, she takes no shit, and 
you know, and she tells you how it is. And, you know, so only great things uh, for her, you know, for her in the future. So it, it'll be, you know, it'll I'll miss her, you know, yeah. on it. Um, the new season actually returns on September 28th. And they have some really good guest stars coming on. They have Woody Harrelson and Kristen Stewart and David Harbour. And Eddie Murphy is actually set to to wow, host for the first time, yeah. you know, as being a, a former, you know, cast member. So that'll be that'll be kind of uh, so. Is this a trend now that they brought Adam Sandler in for his first time hosting? Right. The so former, now they're going to start bringing yeah. well, a lot of them aren't aren't around, unfortunately. You well, know, some of the older no, cast. they're not. But so. but they've got a, a lot of talent that oh, they can pull from. Oh, and that's the that thing cast. is a, a lot of people, you know, have you know gone on, you know, and been very successful you know lauren michaels definitely has the golden touch when it you know comes to to certain things sure so awesome so we wish her well absolutely so in sad news we lost valerie harper yeah this this came uh came out last night uh that she had passed away we knew she had not been doing well um there were actually news reports not that long ago uh, where her husband actually had declined hospice. Yeah, um, he, he did not. He was not ready to let go. No, he he wasn't. Um, and you know, it, it's a hard thing. Um, so you know, one of the TV's most beloved sidekicks. You know, she was. You know, came to to popularity um, on the Mary Tyler Moore Show as uh, Mary's. You know, uh, neighbor uh, Rhoda Morgan Stern. Um, and from, you know, the Mary Tyler Moore show, once that ended, she actually got a spinoff of, you know, the Rhoda show that lasted, I believe, uh, four or five seasons. Yeah. Um, and that was interesting because it started out with her basically moving back to New York, reconnecting with her family, um, meeting somebody, getting married, and actually before the, the series had ended, she was separated, you know, and back to being a, oh, nice, a single... Nice cross-section of America there. <laughs> you know, a single woman, you know, in, in the 70s. So, you know, it, it was an interesting commentary of, you know, of our time. Yeah. Um, her daughter actually had tweeted out um, that, you know, her father basically saying, my beautiful, caring wife of 40 years had passed away. Uh, rest in peace, uh, Mia Valeria. Uh um, and that, you know, bunch of different people, you know, obviously came forward. Ed Asner, who was a, a co-star, oh, yep, yep. um, had said, you know, called her a great friend. Good night, beautiful. I'll see you soon. Um, in 2009, <clears throat> she had actually had a cancerous tumor removed on her lung. And in 2013, the doctor told her that her cancer had spread to areas surrounding the brain. <clears throat> and she probably wouldn't make it through the spring. Uh, in typical Harper fashion, she remained upbeat in interviews uh, and, uh, and as a guest on the TV talk show The Doctors in March of 2013, uh, she said, more than anything, I'm living in the moment. I want Americans and all of us to be less afraid of death and knowing it is just a passage. Don't go to the funeral before the day of the funeral. While you're living, live. Good philosophy. Good philosophy as well. So awesome. Well, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and that is it for our entertainment news. Mm -hmm. We will be back with our insightful picks of the week. As always, I bow to you, dear. <laughs> Do you? Do you bow to me? <laughs> Not so much. My back usually hurts. So I. <laughs> I, I bow in spirit. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so my insightful pick is actually an older show, but the reason why I bring it up is because there's something new coming around with it. Um, so, of course, you always like to make fun of me because of my British shows. <laughs> that I'm... You do love a good British accent. I do. I do. And this one is obviously... Downton Abbey, one of the the big Downtown one. Downtown Abbey. <laughs> Downtown Abbey. Um, <laughs> Sounds like an MTV VJ. <laughs> Downtown Abbey Brown. <laughs> um, so it's a historical drama that follows the lives of the Crawley family and their servants in the family's Edwardian country house. The program um, begins in 1912 with the sinking of the Titanic, which leave Downton's Abbey. They did it, didn't they? 
Yeah, exactly. It was a, <laughs> so basically because of the sinking of the, the Titanic, it leaves Downton Abbey's future in jeopardy as Lord Grantham's heir, his cousin James, and his son Patrick had died uh, on the ship, leaving them without a male offspring to take the throne of of is, Downton. Is there really a throne? No, I don't remember there actually being. Is it made being. of swords? No. no. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. Um, and so basically, as a result, Lord Grantham is on the search for a new heir. Um, and it basically progresses throughout um, the decade. Um, so you have, you know, British, you know, the British at war with Germany. Um, you have World War I. Um so basically, the whole series takes place between 1912 and 1926. And, you know, you see the different things that had happened throughout history and how, you know, they reacted to it or, or how it affected them. Um, so you have, you know, obviously the Titanic. Then you have the First World War, Spanish influenza pandemic, um, the Irish War of Independence, um, you know, various different things, you know, throughout and, you know, the the three daughters growing up. And Now, I've never watched this show, but the way you're describing it now, it sounds like a British version of... Um, Forrest Gump. <laughs> Where you're transposing these characters across historical events. Kind of, but not, you know, not really. They're not, you don't see their part in it. You Just see, how it affects. Right. Oh, okay, you know, okay. like with World War One, like, you know, Lord Grantham goes off and he fights in the war and some of the servants go. And, you know, now they're coming back and, you know, the one servant was a... a not a low rank, you know, like a higher rank. So, you know, and he was kind of like a, a footman and here, you know, he was at, you know, like this level in the war, but in the house, he's at this level. Like now you have to take orders. I'll, I'll How take do a, you, I'll take a moment to explain to you. Same thing I explained to our daughter. Hand gestures don't work <laughs> in an audio podcast. I understand that. <laughs> So he's up really high, you know, when he's in the army. So he's a high military rank, but low household rank. Right, exactly. Okay. So it's, you know, so it's interesting to see where, you know, things kind of go back into place. How do you get back into, you know, your place in society after you've okay. just been, you know, in the war and, and things like that. So then what's the big new news for it? So obviously the big news, which... You know, anybody that's a fan already knows this, but we haven't talked about it on the podcast yet, is that they are actually doing a movie of Downton Abbey, which will actually be um, coming out September 20th, and it's set in 1927. So it's a year after the last season okay, um, so had it's ended. A continuation so of it's what a continuation, was. you know, just like kind of a, I it's, guess, an update of... So it's not like, oh, 30 years later, here's what the household looks like now. Right. Okay. It, it's, it, you know, the, the idea is basically seeing how, you know, people are kind of getting away from having a full staff of, you know, of servants and maybe only having three servants, you know, like, right. where's this person? Where's this person? And you kind of saw that in the series, too, where, you know, people were being let go because, you know, for each, you know, person in the household, maybe they didn't need three different servants servants just for them. They only needed one. So, you know, you got to see the house kind of, you know, <laughs> slimming down. So, 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 okay, so that's the... <laughs> <laughs> That's the life crisis they have. How many servants do I have? Well, and that how, was like, how does the average human being even relate? Well, to that? and and that was kind of what was interesting because the one character he starts off as the chauffeur. He's you know he's the blue collar you know person and be and falls in love with one of the daughters, marries her. You know, um, she unfortunately passes away, but they have a daughter, so he's in the family and he has a hard time with that, you know, letting the opulence of, of everything kind of take over and, Oh, I have to go get dressed before I have lunch. I have to go change before dinner. I have to go put on my tuxedo for that. Like, he, and that kind of adds the everyday man aspect to it. Like he just thinks it's silly, but then, you know, it's like, all right, well, this is our tradition. 
Okay, you know, and he kind of makes changes throughout, you know, the years to kind of, you know, bring them a little bit more down. But all this is okay because it's a lot of British accents. So. Absolutely, sure okay. is. That's how we justify it. Absolutely. Uh, so I believe you, if you've never seen it and, you know, are, are interested, I believe Amazon Prime has it. I know some of the local PBS stations have it, you know, on demand if you're a, a member. Um you know, obviously the people that are going to go, <clears throat> excuse me, and see the movie are going to be people that were fans, you know, of the show. I'm I, not going to take you to go see it because you're not going to know. I'd appreciate that. <laughs> you're not going to know anything about it. Um, how many seasons were there? Uh, it was, I believe it was six seasons. Uh, the first episode aired in 2010 and the final episode was actually on Christmas Day in 2015. So, there, so there's a lot of content to watch mm -hmm. there. Yep, yep. Cool. All right. Well, good pick. Thank, Thank you. you. So my pick this week is a documentary. <gasps> I'm so shocked. <gasps> uh, I have been watching History's Greatest Hoaxes. And what actually kind of turned me on to this was when I was watching the one show that I used as a insightful pick about the uh, – allegations that the moon landing was fake. Mm -hmm. So I found it interesting, the scientific methods that they took to get to that point. So I'll read the intro to this one. Okay. The Loch Ness Monster, Hitler's Diaries, uh, the Roswell Alien Autopsy, and the Moon Landings. These are the stories that amazed and enthralled the world. Yet what if they were too tantalizing to be true? The History Channel reveals the stories of the world's tallest tales in history's greatest hoaxes, complete with fresh footage from the hoax sites, new interviews with those involved, specially filmed recreations and contributions from top experts. Who dreamed up the hoaxes? Why did they do it? Who exposed them? And what were the consequences? It's time to find out as well as examine 10 of the world's most infamous hoaxes. History's Greatest Hoaxes looks at some of the most spectacular hoaxes that show that you can fool some of the people some of the time, but not all the people all the time. It looks at remarkable hoaxes, including Hitler's Diaries, The Piltdown Man, The War of the Worlds Broadcast, uh, Papillon, and The Loch Ness Monster, and the Alien Autopsy film. <laughs> okay. Um, so some of these are obvious hoaxes. Right, but right. what's interesting about the show is they take you through and delve into a level of detail that most documentaries on these have never looked at before. Okay. You see how some of these hoaxes were perpetrated. Mm -hmm. You see some of the props that were used. Like for the Loch Ness Monster one, they go back and they look at like, I don't know, six or eight of the most famous photos or videos of it. Okay. And... They show you how they were created. One that was back in, I think, the 40s or 50s was a combination of a cardboard cut out of a head okay. on top of a toy submarine from Woolworth. Okay. <laughs> you know, and someone built it. And right, then, right. You know, they interview a gentleman who's a researcher in it, mm -hmm. and he, he built a replica of it. You okay. can see how it works and everything. And you're like, okay, I can yeah. see that. And it's like, okay, well, they filmed it from this angle, so the waves look like they're right. larger than normal. Because really, the 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 prop that they used was about two feet long. Okay. And the way they took the pictures, it was <coughs> it, it was looked a, the fourth perspective. Yeah. Type thing. So right. it was. It's very. It's very interesting to see how they did this. Uh, the one that I just watched uh, uh, yesterday was the alien autopsy one. And they actually go in and they interview the, the special effects artist who was hired by this one guy to recreate it. And, and it's interesting because the person who created the film did it under the guise of, well, he received this film from the army um, soldier who did filmed the alleged okay. autopsy originally from Roswell. Okay. And he got the film from the guy because the guy was on his deathbed and he wanted the information out there. But the film was so deteriorated <laughs> that there were only six frames from the original film. So it's less than a second. I was going to say. And these were included in the recreation. Okay. <laughs> but they don't show you where it is or anything like that. So 
the story goes is that, you know, the guy took these six frames from this original film that he could recover, went to a special effects expert. Okay. And the guy created a, a cadaver, you know, a fake cadaver okay. using various meat parts from the local market and, <clears throat> and everything else. Um, but it was portrayed in such a way as this is not the full original film. This is a loyal recreation of it based on what we saw from the original. So okay. it was one of these, you know, I heard it from someone who heard it from someone who heard it from someone, and then we recreated it. Right, right. So there was always this idea that it's probably fake, but here's what we have, and you... You decide. You know, you, he, they, they basically, they sold it to Fox, and like because Rupert Murdoch will buy anything. Right, right. They sold it to Fox <laughs> and a couple other uh, broadcasters, and said, all right, you guys verify whether it's real or not. Um, and, you know... <laughs> For you know, in in Fox's case, they didn't even bother to. They basically put it out there as as a as a special and, and right that it was real. Right. I remember. Right. And I was like, oh, was like, look, you, alien or to, uh, autopsy. Look right. what we got. Right. You know, our you hands decide on. if it's real. You know. So I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> whatever, guys. Right. Right. Uh, but the film is neat because they <clears throat> they they go about it in a scientific method where they look at it. Mm-hmm. But they do it through a series of interviews, recreations, and stuff like that. And some of the people, it's, you'd love it because it's a British <laughs> special. There's a lot of people with British accents. Um, if there's nobody with a British accent, I won't watch. <laughs> well, and it's it's funny who they get because like one guy's a comedian, another guy's okay. like a professional skeptic, another guy's a, a okay. journalist. So another, uh-huh. then they have a scientist. So they bring these all these different aspects in to offer perspective on it. And it's like quasi science with a little bit of humor to sort of poke fun at these things. Okay. Um, the film was a, the show was originally uh, put out by History Channel back in 2016, but okay. it is available for streaming now on Netflix. Awesome, good pick. So, History's greatest hoaxes. And that was all I had. Did we have any afterthoughts? I don't think we did. All right, I think we are done. Uh, we will be back next week with another great podcast and uh we have a couple of interesting shows in the works right now that we will have for the network itself i don't think we have anything special planned right now we don't have any more events that we're doing right now not for us that we know of but we do know that our insights into teens uh podcast we'll have uh something special coming up in the next couple of weeks right and uh you're also working on a new channel uh insights into tomorrow tomorrow yes so hopefully we should have uh, that uh airing premiering soon so keep your eyes out for that but other than that we'll see you next week have a good week everyone bye bye